I think. Uh, so that's the sort of thing they've been able to achieve. In contrast, Rom's maybe a little bit uh, behind the uh, egg. Uh, it's just got a smaller community, a different ownership model, but it, it's also developing really nicely. So fascinating places to visit in their own right. And this little quote from John Hudson uh, really uh, kind of, for me, capture, captures that. Uh, but uh, there's an uh, interesting and, and very uh, hopeful uh, uh, islands uh, with a lot of energy and a lot of interest most especially geological, uh, but much deeper than that. So where are we? We're just south of Skye uh, in the Inner Hebrides. Uh, and these are the four small islands of Canna, Rum, Egg and Muck, uh, accessible from Malig and Arisig by ferry. Uh, both of them with accommodation, a variety of accommodation and shops and communities uh, and uh, really easy to get to and easy to visit. Your biggest challenge, of course, is getting up to Malig or Arisig, but uh, that's all part of the journey. <laughs> um, and in terms of geology, uh, the simplified map of uh, Scotland shows uh, where we are sitting uh, in the rift, uh, the edge of the mainland and with this amazing complex mix. Uh, what we've got here is basically um, old continental crust, uh, which is stretched and rifted and formed uh, sedimentary and igneous rocks uh, in fairly recent times. So this is the youngest bit of Scotland's geology. Uh, and uh, what I love about it is the mix of the, the geological contrasts. Each island has got a different character and it comes from that geology and the contrast between the islands, which are each very different and the views you get over both the Outer Hebrides uh, and to the Scottish mainland and that feeling that you're in this, this basin or this, this rift and, and such a huge uh, variety of rock ages and types across uh, the area. Um, so uh, this uh, map is from the Geology of Egg book uh, and just pick out sort of three main episodes. Uh, first of all, we've got this very ancient uh, continental crust, uh, most of it uh, more than 400 million years old, a lot of it far, far older than that, and including wonderful rocks like Lewisian Nice and the Torridonian Sandstone uh, and the metamorphic rocks uh, of the, the, high, the Northern Highlands. So that has been in existence for a long time from uh, particularly the co collision of continents uh, during the Caledonian orogeny 400 million years ago. That's kind of what brought all this together. So it's sitting there, it's drifting northwards, and then it starts to rift. Uh, and so we've got a long, slow development of a rift valley in a continental setting uh, with accumulation of new sediment in the rift uh, and, a, and a gradual uh, input coming from the sea uh, as the North Atlantic starts to form. Uh, and then after a, a long development of that uh, instead of subsidence we get huge scale volcanic activity and uplift uh, and surface volcanic activity and individual volcanic centers uh, all in the paleogene period the old tertiary period so right, right at the start of that uh, and uh, that dies down 55 after 55 million years and uh, uh, ago uh, and then we've got erosion to, to produce the present uh, the present uh, uh, landscape uh, and uh, the coastline and the islands. So to start at the beginning, starting on Rum, uh, when you arrive on Rum, you usually come into uh, the eastern side into Kinloch uh, and you're in the, the northern half of the island, uh, which is dominated by this wonderful Torridonian sandstone. Uh, so you see it a lot on the west coast of Scotland, uh, lovely thick accumulation of sedimentary rock. Uh, and what's amazing about it is that it's so old, uh, but is uh, you know, not been deformed. It's not been caught up in the, the later plate tectonic collisions. It's been there as, as a basement. Uh, and so in the north half of Rum, uh, you see it as uh, tilted, uh, slightly uh, dipping uh, layers of this sandstone, weathering down. So it's covered in, in bog and vegetation. Uh, <coughs> this picture is looking from uh, the high ground of, in the centre of Rum, the Rum Coolin, uh, across the northern half of the island uh, to uh, the sky, uh, Coolin, the black Coolin of sky uh, on the horizon there. So it's you know, pretty close and pretty dramatic. And that's just that, you know, one, one view and one example of the contrast we get uh, across uh, the islands. So beautiful sandstone uh, formed uh, before 1000 uh, million years ago uh, and uh, from erosion of land, uh, metamorphic rock and other rocks to the northwest and transport by rivers. Uh, so it's a continental uh, sandstone. It's got a nice red color to it. It's very rough. It's very pebbly uh, and uh, it's containing good evidence of uh, 
uh, of the way it formed. But the, the most amazing thing is it survived in a thousand uh, million years. So that's the, the kind of continental basement of this area. That's the uh, original uh, rocks. And <clears throat> when you look from the high ground on rum over towards egg, you see this contrast. Egg is a very different shape. Uh, it's much lower. Uh, and uh, the geology uh, is uh, very uh, different. Uh, so uh, we'll jump across uh, to Egg uh, now and look back the way to the mountains of Rum. Uh, and we've crossed over the Kamasunari Fault. So the Kamasunari Fault is named from Kamasunari on Sky. So it's a fault line that runs uh, south from Sky uh, between the two islands. Uh, and its main uh, evidence of, of its movement is downward faulting uh, on the Egg side. Uh, so standing on egg, looking across uh, the sound of rum, uh, the rocks at sea level on egg uh, are fairly young sedimentary rocks from Jurassic period across at uh, the base of uh, uh, the shore there on rum. So these uh, cliffs on rum, I'll just draw it around there just to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, these are <coughs> the Torridonian sandstone. Uh, so we've got at sea level, at the same level, uh, we've got this contrast um, and uh, the egg stuff has dropped downwards. Uh, the Torridonian sandstone on egg is buried, not at the surface at all. And in fact, we don't even know uh, what it is. It may be that there's, uh, 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 within that, that fault line, there may be a, a separation of the basement as well. So it may be a completely different basement, who knows? Uh, but it, it's definitely buried. Uh, and, and similar, we'll come to the volcanic rocks uh, later, but it's exactly the same thing. On egg, you get uh, surface volcanic rocks, lava flows, uh, whereas on rum, there's very few lava flows left. They've been at a higher level and they've been eroded away uh, to expose plutonic rocks from uh, the central volcano. Uh, so that fault alone, uh, and it's not the biggest fault in the world, it's not the biggest fault in this area, uh, it's uh, regional importance, but absolutely crucial in uh, that uh, different level uh, which erosion has got to on the different rocks that we see uh, on either side of uh, the fault line. Uh, so that's the main uh, feature which is responsible for the very different characters of the islands and that's not just a topographic thing uh, on egg and this uh, western coast uh, you are sitting on fairly fertile land it's been crofted for a long time uh, is there's a bit, of, a bit of lime content within the sedimentary rocks so it's not too uh, not too bad it's quite well drained uh, and uh, has uh, historically uh, supported crofting and crop growing uh, now uh, mostly supports uh, sheep uh, a few cattle as well whereas over on rum the, there was crofting in the past, but smaller scale, uh, isolated pockets in, in some of the glens uh, and just not nearly such an um, attractive uh, uh, place to live and grow crops uh, because of the, the difference in the underlying geology and the steepness and the different climates and particularly the, the soils derived from the geology. Uh, so, so this is one of the kind of big, uh, big influences uh, on uh, the nature of the two islands. So let me tell you a little bit more about the geology of egg and uh, we'll, uh, we'll look at egg and then we'll go back over to rum and just kind of go work our way through uh, the story. Uh, so here's the map of egg from the geology of egg guidebook, which I'll keep plugging. Um, and uh, what we see is a fairly simple geology. Uh, there's a slight tilt to uh, the rocks uh, that they're tilted, they're dipping to the southeast sorry, the southwest, uh, so that we get the older stuff, uh, the yellow on the map uh, is exposed at the northern ends uh, around the northern coast. Uh, and that is a mixture of mostly Jurassic Age sedimentary rock. You'll see in the key, there's a green for a couple little bits of Cretaceous, but it's mainly uh, Jurassic. And then on top of that, with quite a big time gap between them, top of that, we've got a flat lying basalt lava flows uh, from uh, the Paleogene uh, period. Uh, there is a fault line uh, runs across uh, the centre of the island from uh, northwest to southeast, uh, and uh, basically where the road is connecting the two halves of the, of the island. Uh, the fault line's not, um, not had a major impact in terms of the geology, but it's just been a, enough of a, 
of a contrast in the rocks to form an erosional feature. Uh, so it gives this low valley running uh, across the centre of the island. Uh, and the notched shape, uh, I think the derivation of egg is uh, from Norse originally, and it means notched island. Uh, so that's uh, the geology coming out there uh, as well. So I'll take you through uh, the sedimentary rocks, uh, first of all, um, plenty more detail in uh, the guidebook and, and uh, various uh, sources like the geological map. Um, but just to, to give you a, a quick uh, overview, uh, we're look, talking about the middle part of the Jurassic period uh, and there's over 100 metres. It's not a great th thickness of, of sequence here. Uh, and John Hudson, uh, uh, who I mentioned earlier, the author of the guidebook, uh, his, this has been his life's work, one, one element of his life's work when he first uh, went to Egg as a student. Um, and uh, he's responsible for uh, creating the stratigraphy for the Jurassic and the Inner Hebrides. And so the names here, if you know Sky, uh, you might recognize a connection uh, from uh, the Valtos on, on Sky and Leopold Shale uh, formation on, on Sky. Uh, so, so that's the, the connection. And of course, the Sky stuff has become really famous and important just in the last few years uh, with the discovery of lots of dinosaurs, which uh, everyone gets excited about, uh, but are you know, really interesting in terms of uh, uh, the, the mid-Jurassic times, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm told aren't particularly well represented elsewhere. So this is, this is important stuff. Uh, and the, the nice thing is that this renewed interest, which has been so brilliantly done on Sky with a combination of, of, of local geologists and people like Neil Clark at the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow and um, uh, Steve Brissati in Edinburgh University more recently. There's a really nice kind of collaboration there which has found some really exciting stuff. That team went to Egg a couple of years ago and found a, a dinosaur bone, uh, a, I think a pretty big thigh bone. Uh, so that's being worked on and will be will be uh, published uh, hopefully quite soon. Uh, so it's kind of very much putting egg in, in that sequence uh, within uh, linking to, to sky. So it's lesser well known. Uh, so two, two main formations uh, and the overall story, as I mentioned before, is of substance rifting uh, and accumulation of sediment within geographically a fairly narrow zone. Uh, so I don't think there's any of this Jurassic rock would have been found on, on, in Highlands of Scotland. It might have been a small accumulation there, but the main focus uh, was between the, the mainland of Scotland and the Outer Hebrides. Uh, and so we get these Jurassic Age, uh, uh, mid-Jurassic Age. Uh, and so at that stage, you've got uh, an enclosed basin uh, with sediment being washed into it. A lot of it is sand uh, and it's building up in uh, small river deltas coming particularly from the Scottish Highlands, the metamorphic rocks uh, and se sediment coming down into sometimes into shallow seawater. More often it's kind of a lagoonal setting uh, and uh, a lot of it is quite muddy. So an interesting environment uh, dominated by w fresh and brackish and seawater, so quite salt, salt water, so quite a changeable salinity uh, and uh, with a variety of uh, fossil evidence uh, within it. And some shells, uh, there's a little shell called Neomyodon, which you may know, uh, which is really common. It's a particular layers when the, uh, the uh, water salinity has been variable. Uh, apparently it's one of the things that John Hudson has tried to teach me about. I'm not particularly particularly good in fossils. Uh, but the thing that I think everyone um, can get something from, even if they're not a geologist or interested in geology, is the story of uh, Hugh Miller visiting the island. Uh, here's an example of some of the sandstone. I mentioned in the, the previous slide that there's some uh, burnt wood. So we're getting some evidence of the um, surrounding environment forested uplands, forest fires, material getting washed into the, wa the water. But Hugh Miller uh, visited Egg in the 1840s. He did two visits in subsequent summers. This was his summer holidays from a very busy job in Edinburgh uh, as a newspaper editor. Uh, and I was just so full of admiration for, for these early geologists and how much they accomplished in a short time. Uh, so uh, coming to it fresh. There was very little had been recorded before about uh, the geology uh, of the area. And uh, coming to it fresh, he explores the island and he basically does it all. He gets all uh, of the kind of key 
the, the overall geology, but also some really interesting detail. Uh, and he wrote about it. Uh, so he wrote the book called The Cruise of the Betsy, uh, which describes uh, this amazing uh, journey and the, the story and also the social history of the area. Uh, Hugh Miller was very much involved in the creation of the Free Church of Scotland. And that's actually why he was going there. Uh, so you get that story as well. So brilliant writing. And this, I just love this bit. Uh, uh, Hugh Miller discovers plesiosaurs uh, on egg which is the first discovery in Scotland. Uh, and he finds them in this really strange red limestone layer. So it's quite a thin uh, layer. We still find bits of it. This is a bit that someone uh, I was with uh, about five years ago just found lying on the beach. Uh, and he describes the reaction of the shepherd he was with, John Stewart, uh, to the discovery of these uh, very clear vertebrae in the stone and, and the shepherd saying, how on earth can, can that get into the rock? And Hugh Miller goes on to speculate about the, the nature uh, of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the life that he was seeing. I think that's what Hugh Miller is really good at. Um, someone's drawing things in the screen? <laughs> Let's uh, see. If, I don't know if that's happening accidentally, but uh, um, a bit uh, <laughs> distracting. <laughs> um, so, sorry. Uh, the uh, what humor was very good at was describing the geology, but also bring it alive for people. So how uh, here's he, he talks about the nature of these plesiosaurs, these monstrous dragons, and he looks out. He's going to just imagine sitting there looking out to today's sea, and of course, the, today's sea is different from the Jurassic waters. The sea's colder now; it's a bit deeper, but but you know, still we're still looking at that same sort of environment of uh, areas of high ground with the sea between it, uh, and just imagine watching these. Uh, plesiosaurs uh, play around in the shallow waters, uh, warred and wedded, as Hugh Miller put it, and pursuing the, the instincts of their unknown natures uh, and finishing with uh, uh, something which is very common from, from his era of geologists, you know, saying, well, it's unbelievable, uh, but it's true. Here's the evidence. Uh, so a beautiful story. Uh, and uh, Hugh Miller started that uh, investigation, uh, which has been carried on and is still being carried on by, uh, by various geologists. Uh, and he found this layer of limestone that's actually still really hard to find uh, and uh, described it. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, really quite un uh, it's quite a strange situation actually because we've got this hundred odd 150 meters of sedimentary rock uh, there's just a couple of these layers of iron stained limestone and that's where the plesiosaurs are there's lots of other geological curiosities and delights on egg uh, this is just one of them that i love uh, the west coast uh, there is uh, beautiful exposures of uh, the sandstone beds uh, and a lot of them have got these wonderful big concretions within them uh, so these have formed gradually within the sediment a, a chemical change in the cement that's gradually extended outwards and you get these big round uh, balls often uh, approaching kind of half a meter in size they're not quite the meraki boulders of new zealand but they're, they're are very uh, very nice and that's the it's a beautiful geology uh, easily accessible uh, on the coastline uh, uh, the, the different uh, layers of the Jurassic and uh, these views across uh, the sound to uh, rum and the contrast and the geology it's very uh, visible Another geological curiosity just a little bit further north from that is the beach of the Singing Sands, uh, which ha has another sort of aspect that has drawn attention over the years. And uh, when the sand is dry, it uh, um, squeaks as you move it. Uh, so air getting pressed out from between uh, very fine sand grains. It's a particular beach that doesn't have a lot of modern shell within the sediment. So it's very, very fine quartz uh, sand and it sings. So interesting sedimentary rocks, an interesting historical link uh, and this modern twist that uh, people have recently found uh, dinosaur uh, um, bones, which uh, tie in very nicely with the picture on sky. But time to move on to the story of the volcanoes. Uh, so the Jurassic rocks accumulating in that sinking rift, uh, that comes to an end uh, and there's a long period of erosion uh, and then uplift uh, and 
an amazing episode of volcanic activity. Uh, so you're probably aware of, of this story, but it's absolutely fantastic on just on this section of the British coastline uh, from the north of Skye uh, down to Antrim in uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, there's nowhere else like it and an intensity of volcanic activity uh, that's associated with the rifting of the North Atlantic, uh, but is different from the rest of the rift of the North Atlantic. Uh, and that's what continues today uh, with the, the formation of Iceland. Uh, so we see both in Greenland and, and on the, the Scottish coastline and, and, and in Antrim, this massive uh, volcanic activity, uh, which adds so much to the geology and the, and the, the, the variety of this area. So most of it on egg is uh, flat lying basalt lava flows. Uh, so uh, the original uh, extent of this is probably all the way from Skye all the way down to Antrim. Uh, with uh, a whole series of fissure eruptions uh, erupting over a period of a few million years uh, to produce lots of individual lava flows. Uh, if you go to Mull, uh, the sequence of lava, same age as this, uh, is uh, a thousand meters. So there's an awful lot of it, quite a big extent of it. Uh, and very typically, it is eroding away and making these really kind of messy uh, scree covered cliffs. Uh, so you see very similar things, particularly in the, the north coast of Skye. Uh, and uh, Iceland shows us the ongoing activity. So if you go to Iceland today, you can see fissure eruptions that have, this one's from 1985, but you see the fissure eruptions that have formed uh, flat lying uh, fissure, uh, uh, plat sort of plateau basalt uh, lavas. Uh, so the bulk of egg is uh, layers of uh, basalt sitting on top of the older Jurassic rocks uh, and tilted gently like the underlying layers uh, and covering most of the high ground. Uh, and basalt is basalt. It's not the most exciting rock in the world, but there's lots of interesting features to see here in terms of uh, the lava flows. Uh, so the picture on uh, the right, uh, you can see uh, that uh, uh, the whole cliff is just made up of a series of layers. Each one tends to be just a few meters thick. And so it's representing a flow uh, which is spread out over a few weeks, maybe a few months at the most, and then the local volcanic activity has died down and that surface of lava has sat exposed to the warm climate uh, and developed a soil, a bit of erosion, a bit of withering of the, the lava top, uh, maybe a bit of uh, vegetation growing on that, and then maybe centuries later, the next eruption, uh, which forms another layer on top. And so gradually over a couple of million years build up this quite uh, impressive thick pile of uh, basalt lava. The picture on the left is the south coast, uh, and that's a, another very accessible bit of coastline uh, where uh, there's a couple of big caves in this sequence uh, and uh, allows you to get close up to uh, see some of uh, the lava flows without risking your neck and some of the, the higher cliffs. Um, and these are some of the, the features we see. Um, the uh, individual lava flows tend to have a stratification within them uh, in that uh, the gas within it will tend to rise within the lava flow so that the top is more bub uh, bubbly, uh, more vesicular, uh, and that makes it a little bit weaker. As I mentioned uh, before, it also uh, very commonly the weather, the, the, the lava top has weathered. So the picture on the left at the top is this beautiful uh, oxidized uh, iron uh, sort of laterite soil that's formed on uh, one of the lava flows. And then the next lava flow is covered over and preserved it. So these uh, uh, lava flow tops tend to be quite weak uh, because of the weathering, because of the gas bubbles. Uh, and so you tend to get erosion uh, of that, uh, uh, that weaker layer and a stepping back of the lava flow above it. Uh, and that is what makes trap topography just seen the world over in, uh, in basalt, uh, in sequences of basalt lava flows. And you see it on egg uh, creating the, the landscape. Uh, it's basalt rich in olivine, which withers, breaks up and oxidizes quite easily. So that picture on the left is kind of, the bottom left is kind of typical uh, of, a, of a withered uh, basalt uh, flow with uh, spheroid, uh, onion skin or spheroidal withering uh, developing. So 
some uh, interesting features to see uh, within these lava flows where the exposure uh, allows it. Another feature of the volcanic province is uh, intrusions. Uh, so dike intrusions are really common associated with this volcanic activity all the way down the coastline and stretching through the south of Scotland and to the northeast of England. Uh, there's a whole series of dikes uh, and uh, on egg uh, you get uh, to see uh, these uh, um, uh, intrusions in close up. We call them dikes, of course, and they're originally named from the Scottish dry stain dikes uh, because they tend to be walls of harder rock uh, where uh, the softer rock they've been intruded into has been eroded. But actually, <coughs> on egg, things are far more interesting. So sometimes, as in the right hand picture here, uh, you get to actually see the, the detail uh, and uh, particularly the dikes that are coming close to the magma that's coming close to the surface uh, will often form very narrow uh, little intrusions. Uh, sometimes they're more parallel sided, but often they're actually eroded out uh, to form uh, uh, gaps in, in the rock sequence. This is my favourite dike uh, on egg. Uh, a couple of metres wide, the basalt's still there, but you can see how uh, actually it's been broken up. Uh, so it's here intruded into Jurassic sandstone. The sandstone should be much softer, uh, but actually the problem is these coastlines are really exposed to Atlantic storms. Uh, so you get waves breaking on these uh, rock faces and the dikes tend to disintegrate. Uh, and in fact, the sandstone sometimes is a bit tougher because the magma has come up through it and uh, has heated it up a bit. Uh, so lots of interesting features to explore uh, dikes that you can follow across uh, the foreshore. Okay, we've got the, a common pattern across the whole of this area uh, with uh, the first episode of the volcanic activity being the plateau lavas that cover the whole area uh, and then intrusions cutting through the whole sequence. But with time in different places, we go on to develop a central volcano. So this diagram, this summary diagram of the whole province is from one of the British Geological Survey uh, publications. Uh, and it shows the, the, the pinkish color of the, the lava flows uh, and then the development of central volcanoes in places like Sky and Rum and Arran. Uh, and a, a common sort of sequence that will get the surface lava flows first, plateau lava flows first, and then a, a magma chamber develops uh, and we build up a, a, a central volcano. And these central volcanoes now have been eroded uh, so that we don't see much of the surface of them, uh, but we get these fantastic exposed uh, magma chambers. And that applies uh, to uh, all of them. So I picked out their egg and rum uh, just about the time that the surface activity locally was dying down, we get the development of uh, the rum uh, central volcano and it is one of the most uh, impressive geological features of Scotland. Uh, it is tough terrain, uh, there's a lot of detail here which is hard to get to uh, but uh, even if you've only got uh, a couple of days, uh, if, if you get good weather it's uh, uh, the, the basics of it are very accessible. Uh, the map on the right, the summary map on the right, uh, shows what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about uh, basaltic composition magma chamber, which is formed within the existing crust. So it's formed within that older Torridonian sandstone. Uh, and what's special about the magma chambers here is that they show evidence of cycles of cooling and crystallization. Uh, and that makes some very interesting uh, geology. Uh, this is looking up to the high ground of the Rum Coolin uh, from, uh, from Kinloch, from the, the, the place that most people live. Uh, and that contrast between the slopes, the kind of grassy forested slopes uh, of eroded Torridonian sandstone and this tough igneous rock, a variety of igneous rocks, mostly basaltic in composition, uh, but very varied. So let's zoom in a wee bit uh, to uh, the first of the summits, uh, which is Halaval, and this clear crystal layering. It, from a distance, it looks sedimentary, but it's actually crystal layering within uh, a magma chamber. Uh, and what Rum shows and what's made it uh, internationally important, uh, it shows uh, an example of the magma, the processes within a magma chamber. Uh, and it's, it shows that magma chambers aren't just simply a blob of magma 
which is all formed at once uh, and has crystallized gradually and solidified, and that's been it. Uh, what rum shows is a variation in the chemistry of the magma with time in a cyclical pattern. Uh, so uh, the original primitive magma starts to cool down and crystallize. It forms olivine crystals. They drop out of the liquid uh, and leave magma with a changed composition. So with time, the magma gets more silica rich. Uh, so you form olivine crystals and then pyroxene crystals and then feldspar crystals. Uh, but it then switches again. So it's thought to be an injection of new fresh magma coming into the magma chamber, uh, changing its composition to be more iron and magnesium rich to form olivine crystals again. It's quite a controversial thing. And there's some de details are, uh, we won't go into tonight, but there's, so, so there's some ongoing discussion, shall we say, about the nature exactly of these layers. But I think most people kind of will, will accept this sort of overall pattern. There might be some complexities in it. But the result is to get layers of plutonic crystalline igneous rock, uh, which are formed within a magma chamber, but are varying compositions. Uh, and the feldspar rich layers, uh, the rock is called troctolite. Uh, the feldspar rich layers are tougher than the olivine rich layers because olivine uh, disintegrates. Uh, so we get uh, a very nice nature connection. Uh, so this is one of the rum rangers from a few years ago monitoring one of the shearwater burrows, these are the Manx shearwater, uh, which live up on these high slopes away from the predators, uh, but they found these soft olivine rich layers that they can dig their burrows into. Uh, and that's, that's their habitat. That's, they live there and they can do it because of that contrast in geology. So there's a close up of just one very small part of the layers uh, within the magma chamber. The whole thing's beautifully messy. Uh, it's not just a, a nice, beautiful you know, kind of spherical body with uh, neat layers. The layers go all over the place. Uh, there's lots of evidence of later uh, events. Uh, you see drop stones where a blob has tumbled down a slope and smashed into uh, layers that's come from somewhere else in the magma chamber. Lots of rich detail and as I say still, still lots of research going on to, to tease it out. Uh, but that's just kind of typical. You can see the, the base of the um, sequence there. Uh, there's the accumulation uh, of uh, olivine crystals going up that way and a gradual change in chemistry to get more and more feldspar and then push a change again uh, as the, the chemistry of the magma changes. Beautiful, beautiful rocks. They're really coarse and crystalline. The mineralogy is really uh, obvious uh, and uh, lots of variation. Uh, other, other areas where you get uh, intrusions within the, the layering and, and stuff like that. Oh, very beautiful. And mostly, uh, I say there's a lot of this very inaccessible, very hard to get to. Uh, but um, the uh, just going to the main centre and walking across through the centre of the island on a really good track, you get to, to access some of it. So it's, it's not all impossible to get to. Running out of time, but uh, just, just mention that as well as all that plutonic stuff, there's some other really rich parts of the, the rum story. There's some surface material, particularly some silica rich surface material. Uh, and this bit, which is called a mega breccia, uh, that uh, block in the middle is a couple of meters across. Uh, beautiful exposures uh, of a lot of this uh, volcanic material. Uh, and uh, just tiny little details which just add so much to the richness, both in terms of the geology and the human story. Uh, because if you make your way over to uh, the west coast, uh, there's a low range of hills which have got some surface lava flows in them. So these are later lava flows. Uh, and uh, some of them, one, one or two of the flows have got this beautiful pockets of chalcedony. Uh, and this was discovered in the early history of the area and people traded this stuff, mined it and traded it as a, a, a tool. Uh, so in an absence of flint uh, and uh, other things that can be sharpened, this was a, a brilliant discovery. Uh, and uh, even in Victorian times, it was being quarried and, and uh, used as, as jewellery. Uh, so it's called bloodstone because it's got little flecks of jasper in it. And uh, geologically, it's just a, a side part of the, of the big story, but it's really interesting and really, uh, really uh, varied. Over on that western side there's granite as well, so similar to sky as well as the main volcanic centre of basaltic composition we've also got a formation of, uh, of a granite uh, pluton right next to it and that's a pattern we see 
right up and down uh, the coastline. Right, back to Egg for the final part of our story, uh, which is this amazing ridge uh, called the Skur of Egg. Uh, and if you get to, if you only get a chance to go to Egg for a day, which is possible for, um, uh, you, you can you can go and do this bit of geology. It's, it's very accessible from the ferry terminal, and it only takes a couple of hours to, to get up there and see it. So this is pitch stone. And it's a really unusual rock uh, in the west coast of Scotland, in the volcanic province. Uh, it's uh, very glassy, a uh, bit of a water content, but not far from obsidian. And it forms this curious snaking ridge that runs across uh, the south end of Egg. Uh, so uh, here is uh, Anne Skewer itself, which is the, the head of it. Uh, but you can see it continues over to uh, the east. Uh, that's the view on the right of Anskur. That's the view you see as you, you start to walk up to it from uh, the ferry. Uh, so very steep sided, uh, very tough rock. It's actually, uh, when you see it close up, uh, cooled down into columns. Uh, and it's completely different in its chemistry and its formation from the lava flows that it sits on. It's famous in its own right. Um, Hugh Miller investigated it. Uh, here's uh, another famous geologist, Archibald Geeky, uh, writing about it in terms of the, the scenery and this understanding that what we're seeing here is a very, very tough rock that formed within a valley. Uh, so it's inverted topography. Uh, which uh, means that the, there was uh, the original basalt lava flows, uh, which uh, um, were there a million years before the pitchstone formed. Uh, so they were eroding away with river erosion. There's a nice steep V-shaped, quite, quite steep kind of gully carved by a river through this. And then the pitchstone has been formed and has filled in the valley. Uh, and because it's harder, as the rest of the rocks round about have eroded away, we're left with this ridge. Uh, it's not quite the whole of the valley, as you only see about half, I'll go back to that last uh, picture, uh, because it shows it quite nicely. Uh, so here's the junction coming down like that, uh, and it kind of flattens out there and it goes back up. Uh, so a couple of hundred metres across, 100 metres or, or more deep, uh, but this is a valley that's been filled in uh, with uh, uh, the pitch stone. And so it's been celebrated uh, uh, through uh, uh, the, from the original discovery by Hugh Miller and argued over was it a lava flow, was it an intrusion uh, but uh, some of the, the evidence uh, from, that Hugh Miller found actually and, and has been, been added to um, here's the, this, the valley shape again uh, but this bottom section just beneath the pitch stone is conglomerate uh, and that's where Hugh Miller found some fossilised pine trees, fragments of fossil pine trees. So it adds to this picture of an existing river valley with boulders being washed along in the base of it, uh, trees growing in it, uh, and then it fills with this, uh, this pitch stone. However, pitch stone is really silica rich and tends to be silica rich lava flows don't flow. And one of the curious things about this is that at 10 miles out past Rum, there's another patch of it. It's called this, this uh, little island, one of Stevenson lighthouses in Heiskill. So two different fragments, widely separated. Uh, and uh, nobody really answered that question about where it had come from. But as time went on and we got better information about the dates and the timings, uh, that was a, an, a problem, an issue to solve. Uh, and it's been solved beautifully by this fairly uh, recent work uh, by David Brown, who's a volcanologist at that stage. Was I think this was his PhD, part of his PhD at Glasgow University, and Brian Bell. And they developed this theory that it's not a lava flow at all, uh, but it's actually the result of large scale pyroclastic activity. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of technical detail in their paper, um, but uh, it's really good stuff, a really careful job. Uh, and so basically they're saying, yeah, it looks like it's a, a glassy lava flow, uh, but actually it's the result of pyroclastic flows uh, where there's been a big volcanic explosion, which has covered the whole landscape with this uh, hot ash deposit and it's welded together uh, to form an ignimbrite. 
this diagram, summary diagram, comes from again from the geology of egg. Just, just I, I, John and I trying to explain this 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 new theory. And here's a picture from their paper uh, and some of the uh, the detail. Uh, I'm sure you're all thinking, oh yes, obviously it's syndepositional realmorphism. Um, so, so there's quite a lot here, but a brilliant job uh, and a really nice uh, theory uh, to basically explaining how this pitch stone got there how it formed within these valleys uh, and uh, their separate uh, bits of it. So if anyone's got any questions about that, this afterwards, I can, I can try and answer, I'll tell you a wee bit more of the detail or, or send you the, the paper afterwards. So where's the smoking gun? Um, back to that diagram I showed you before. Uh, with uh, the uh, egg uh, basalt lava flows about 60 million years ago, and then a, a gap of over a million years. That, that there's a typo here. It's actually 58.7 uh, million years ago that this thing uh, formed. And uh, well, the near volcano is rum, but the rum volcano was extinct, was well extinct by that time. It still would have been an edifice on the surface. So it would have been a high physical uh, uh, structure but it was definitely extinct. And the only other one is sky. And that was what uh, this uh, recent research by David Brown suggested that actually what we're seeing here is a silica rich eruption from miles away on sky. So that idea was uh, picked up in another paper uh, just last year, uh, lots of other uh, famous uh, names here, including Henley Emilius, who I mentioned before, um, and uh, developing that story, really, um, and uh, noting the link with uh, Highscare. Here's uh, Highscare, uh, sorry, uh, Highscare's out here, this little island uh, past Rum. Here's Egg with its pitch stone, and suggesting that that's what we see there is just little fragments of a much uh, bigger story. Uh, that possibly that whole area, and if you know, depending on whether the eruption was directed uh, like a Mount St. Helens blast, or more likely it's just a vertical thing that covers a, a, a huge area with uh, silica debris, silica rich debris, which is really hot and welds to make uh, the signal bright layer. But it's only on these little patches that's been left and hasn't been eroded. And these guys in this recent paper went a little bit further and suggested, well, actually, if this is just evidence of large scale volcanic activity, uh, silica rich explosive activity uh, in this area, in this province at that time, well, it links very nicely uh, with uh, uh, the Eocene, as Paleocene Eocene uh, thermal maximum. So it may be that that, cl that major climate change episode is linked to the volcanic ash uh, and the volcanic products in. The atmosphere. So a wonderful story, uh, a great bit of geology, uh, really accessible and a lot of detail there, but the main features of it are really easy to access. Uh, this is this beautiful ridge uh, viewed from the side. Time for me to stop, uh, but uh, I hope you've enjoyed this wee introduction to uh, the geology of egg and rum. Uh, the view uh, taken when I was a student uh, on top of uh, Azkabal on rum, looking across to egg one, uh, one New Year trip to the islands. Uh, beautiful islands, uh, beautiful geology, uh, and it's, it's this wonderful contrast that you get in many places of a great geological story accompanied by lots of detail of different aspects of it. So there's lots of things to puzzle over and lots of unanswered questions as well. Uh, but also the way that this mix of rocks has contributed to not just these islands, but the whole landscape of the west coast of Scotland. I know it's a favourite place for, for many people. Uh, and for me, uh, it, what I love about the, that area is just that the contrast between each of the islands with its different character, its different human story, uh, different landscape, and that contrast between the islands and the mainland and the Outer Hebrides. It's all very close together. It's a small area of, of Scotland, but it's uh, beautifully, uh, richly varied. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me along this evening. Very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Angus. That was really good. I'm sure everybody's really enjoyed seeing all those wonderful pictures. And 